any day that you have the legendary Penny Kittle gracing your podcast is a wonderful day. We're here to celebrate your book birthday, Miss Kittle. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great day to celebrate. <laughs> well, we need more and we hope you have more and more birth book days because we ever with every book you teach us and you support us as we work with our kids. So every book, imagine all the thousands and millions of kids lives mm. that you touch. That is a powerful thing to say. I appreciate that. I just don't imagine that when I'm writing it at all. I think of one teacher that I'm writing to. <gasps> okay, so we'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> Because <laughs> I want to I wanna have you tell us about that one teacher in the future. But let's mm. tell us about a, a story. Because I know that you used to host a podcast. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, your podcast is beautiful. And you would tell us stories about your students. And, and I would clearly remember, like, working out in the gym and, like, stopping and just, like, imagining being in your classroom. Well, you asked me to think of a story that um, kind of changed what I thought about teaching. Yeah. And there have been so many that I didn't really know what to choose, but I started thinking about a young girl I had. I was teaching fifth grade and it was my second year of teaching. I was in a tiny little school and, you know, filled with all of the anxieties of really not knowing what I should be doing, but constantly watching my students and trying to learn what they needed. And I had a girl who stole all of the money out of our games in the math center. And as a teacher making no money, I, I think maybe I put 20 bucks into this game, but it was this real money exchange so they could learn the values of money and um, as one of their activities. And I knew because other students told me she'd taken it, but when I asked to talk to her, she um, was crying immediately and, and um, I didn't know what to do. And I ended up telling her that there had to be a consequence and I was going to have her stay in and clean the math center while the rest of us were going out. And, you know, outside recess is pretty important for every kid. And I regretted it right away, but I didn't know what to do. And I didn't know um, if I approached my principal, if he would simply scold me for having real money in my classroom and, you know, all of those things that you just try to solve yourself when you're a teacher. So I got back in and there was a note on my desk from her. And I remember I stuffed it in my bag and I drove home. And when I got home, I opened it. It was a gorgeous day. I was sitting on my porch and it was this anguished letter about not only her regret for doing it, but begging me to take her home and be her mom. And I just was weeping by the time my husband came home from work. And I, you know, I was 22 years old. I didn't know how to parent myself, let alone a child, a 12 year old, 11 year old. And, but I did not know how could I possibly say no. She detailed all of these things that were awful that were at her house and her mother had left long ago. And um, I just was so undone. And what helped as I processed that over the next couple months of the end of the year was I was writing a lot about it. And one of the things I wrote was that we never as teachers know really know the lives of our students right. and the more we show them kindness and compassion and um, a way to be in the world that is forgiving and filled with joy that those were really important things to know as a teacher so you never know everything that was a really important lesson for me because you don't know why a student is doing what they're doing you might have an idea but it's often not it's on the surface we don't really know and the other was that um, there were students that I wouldn't be able to help in the way they wanted me to help them, right. but I would do everything I could to help them in ways that I thought would empower them as they moved forward. And with this student making her a stronger reader, writer, thinker, um, to be able to send me that letter. I mean, I wrote her one back, of course, and the idea that she was owning up to what she'd done and still asking, um, for some kind of relationship was powerful for me that at that young age, she could do that. So 
the hard stories, I think that one thing we learn as teachers is they're hard to live through. There are things that we have to get proximate to that we wish didn't exist in the world. There are kids who don't get enough to eat and have too much responsibility and are left alone and are frightened. Um, and now that I'm in college, students that have been assaulted, that have been um, dealing with depression and anxiety and lost friends to suicide. I mean, the, the complications after all of this year of turmoil um, just remind me all the time that our work is far bigger than curriculum. And part of what kids need from us is who we are in the world, yeah. right? Who are we? What do we believe um, about them, about the possibility? Right. They need us to be like a, if their life sometimes can be stormy, they need us to be like a, like a mountain, like a stable mountain for them. Right? Mm, well said. And so that they, they, they know that when they, when it goes crazy, they have someone in their life to be like, it's okay. You're going to be okay. We're going to be okay together. Yeah. I'm having a lot of those conversations right now. The classes that I teach are filled with students who haven't been away from home. They've been quarantined and now they've moved to a college campus. And, you know, for some of my students, they haven't been in a room of people for a year and a half. And so they're sometimes kind of overwhelmed just by right. all of the faces in the room. And right. like this year, having my students talk to each other about the books they were reading was harder than it's been in years and years. They didn't know what to say. And, you know, eye contact and a lot of changes going on. A lot of changes. A lot of changes. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the your book. Who did you write this book for, including a lot of changes? Uh, well, um, at the end of 180 days, Kelly and I did this um, big deep dive into reflecting on what did we learn in the course of writing that book and teaching together across the country and sharing what was happening in our classes. And we knew each other's students well and all of that. I don't think either one of us was really ready to let it go. Not only did we have that year together, but we had another year of finishing the book. And I remember calling him, I was driving somewhere and I was now at the university and I said, Kelly, there are things these kids need to know that should have been taught in high school. And I was doing them in my research class and in my writing class with essays, but I feel that so many of my students are not prepared for the independence and the decision-making that is the heart of college. And I said, they're essential units they should have had. And he said, well, what are they? And I can remember, I went one, two, three, four. And we actually changed one of them over time as we were working. But I um, immediately, he said, well, that sounds like the next book you're going to write. And I said, no, it sounds like the next book we're going to write. Because <laughs> Kelly was still in the classroom um, in high school. And now I was in college and we could do this bridge between the two. And we, again, connected our students across the country. And we really began exploring together um, what is college reading and writing? How does it look different than the way we're preparing students? And how can we better balance preparing them for tests and, you know, requirements in our districts with true preparation for what's next? Right. When you finish um, 180, when I finished 180, I was like, I just need like 360. I need like more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still remember the videos and I was like, so that's how you do it. And I just do remember mm. the way that you, you conference with a kid and I was like, she's just like the kindest person ever. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what, Tam? That was the hardest part about this book was we had um, Kelly coming to teach in my room this October. We had me going out to teach with him in a classroom that he's working in in Anaheim. Um, and we had to cut everything because of COVID. So we don't have any video yet. Our plan is to have video to support this. I wish you could meet the students I have right now, but you know, nothing is normal yet. So I think as we get farther away from this book, we are gonna have video resources. We're actually recording the audio book in January and we're gonna record some conversations at that time, but the, the work with the kids, we wanna add back in. Right, because they, it just made it real for, for teachers. It <laughs> made it come to life. Yeah, that's so good to hear. Uh, so I'm so happy that you had that book after, so 180 days, and I was like, what's the next one? What's the next one? And I was like, mm -hmm. with this one, I saw this online. I was like, this is the next one. And I'm so 
<laughs> Thank you. I'm pretty excited. It's all shiny and new. All right. I, I, it's, I think um, Einstein said the highest form of sophistication is simplicity. Right. And you yep. really whittled down like an entire curriculum into the, the four essentials. And I was like, tell us, mm. tell us wise one, please. <laughs> That's so interesting. You know, I think that we took the lens of students need more decision making and took it into four places. But of course, we so believe in narrative and storytelling, right? So that would be an essential study that's not in this book, but is part of 180 days. So it isn't everything. It's not the entire kitchen, but it's uh, one way to cook. Uh, so we'll each go through the essential studies and we'll start with the first one, which is essay. Right. And the reason we started with essay writing is that there is probably the biggest disconnect between writing for an assessment, a standardized assessment, a formulaic response, or what people have come to call an academic paper with a thesis in the first paragraph, sometimes at the last line of the first paragraph and three examples. And this formula simply doesn't exist in the university setting. And so the first thing that we wanted people to think with us about is that students are assigned much longer pieces of writing, usually a thousand words or more. And in that, they are given free choice of how to um, support their thinking. But it's often in response to something happening in the world or something they've been given to read. My students this week are reading The Legendary Vampire um, Panic of New England. And they're going to respond to that because we do this. I, have, I teach a course called Ghosts and Other Hauntings. And so we do all kinds of spiritual um, readings. But in this one, they're going to write a response to it. And I think what we don't recognize is that there are no handcuffs on kids for how to respond. In fact, we welcome um, all of the ways that kids communicate now. My students right now, some of them are creating digital compositions on TikTok. Others are um, involved in their own podcasts. And that essay writing, you're, you have something to say to the world, often in response to something else. And you want to have your turn, right? You want to you want to enter this conversation that already exists and you have things to say. So the way we approach essay writing, um, for one, is it's a series of beliefs about what is an essay and then practices. And one of the central practices is to gather students around the whole of the essay and do what we call a drone view so that you can break it into chunks. What did the writer do here? What did the writer do here? Where's the pivot to a different idea? What does that look like? Because if you give students four or five essays that are written in different ways and have them do that kind of deep dive into how does this work with some other students, they begin to tease out, these are moves I can make. These are the options I have. Because if they don't know their options, how could they use them? And then, of course, it's all the practices that we've always believed in. They need to have feedback throughout the writing of that essay. They need conferring in class. They need uh, modeling from a teacher. How do I settle on a subject? How do I then decide how I'm going to write about that subject? So essay writing becomes an exploration, nonfiction, personal essays. My students wrote researched fiction stories right? Very essay-like, but the research is embedded in, they could choose a ghost story from New England and then embed it in real uh, 2021 world of New Hampshire. So lots of possibilities that are, exist within that chapter. Right. You're making it really authentic because I think the reason why teachers often feel like they have to do that formula, like that thesis, introduction, right? Like three supporting body paragraphs. It's because it's, it's efficient because they're, they're trying to teach to that test. They're just trying mm -hmm. to get Okay, here, get past the test, be clear, structuring your, structuring your writing. But you're right, there, there is a disconnect because when we read an article from New York Times of the Atlantic, it's so very yep. different. Right? It, there's a free flow. Right. right. So there has to be a balance. If you have students taking a standardized test, it can be helpful to show them a structure like that. But if they know it's one of many structures, they're so much better prepared for the writing ahead. And what's more important than the structure is that the the writing moves that you talked about, right? Yeah. Because those are the writing yeah. moves that can be transferable. Absolutely. My students right now are studying digital compositions. And we watched one yesterday called, um, uh, I can't remember, it's from the New York Times, and it's something about quitting, um, the case for quitting. And 
we just looked at how she made the case. Simone Biles is her first example that it was good for her to quit. But as it moves, all of the references and the way she builds this argument that we're not talking about quitting things that aren't good for you. We're talking about quitting things that you just do as routine. She comes back to Simone Biles at the end. The kids are all like circle ending because they've studied essays. Oh, even digital, I can recognize she's coming back to where she began. So across, it doesn't matter the medium. We're studying the same kinds of things. Right. And when we, so I think that you're teaching kids to, students to look at a text as an author. So reading a text mm -hmm. to, to examine the moves and that, and then that, that becomes another transferable skill so that when they pick up another text in the future, they can say, what are the moves that this author is doing? Oh, I can see this. Now let me try it my way. Absolutely. And even in my coaching, little third graders can do that. I had first graders, we would say, you know, what are, what are the Cynthia Rylant moves in these picture books? And they'd be, she uses beautiful words. She has the characters talk to each other, right? This is work they can do at a very young age and just continue to build on. Right. And that's how you become authentic writers instead of formulaic writers. So let's move to essential study of the book club. Yeah, we um, had three rounds of book clubs in 180 days. And when we when I moved to the college, we did these cross country book club exchanges like we started in 180 days, but we did all kinds of um, engagements to get these older students to be prepared to talk because our fundamental understanding is that students really want to talk to each other about the books they're reading. They don't want to read in isolation. They really like the, the sense of community and the, wait, you thought that? I didn't think that feel. But they come to book clubs often feeling like they're supposed to have an answer or they're supposed to have some kind of understanding. And so how do we help them take control of the conversation? not wait for the teacher to have a list of questions or um and so a lot of the moves that are in this chapter are around the idea that students come with something to their book club so for example a really great kelly gallagher idea that i loved and have used ever since is in the middle of the book club about three quarters of the way through the book he has students find an infographic that would give the reader of that book even if it's a novel more information about the context that this novel is taking place in and because you have four or five kids in a book club, they all go out and find an infographic and they have to bring it back and say, I would put this on page 297 because right here, the reader might be thinking this and this would add information to that and help them see it as a deeper problem. Well, now you've got four or five kids with four or five different infographics talking deeply. This is analytical thinking about the book and where this is important. And it's what we found is that the more we dig into what are students bringing to the book club, the more rich those discussions became and completely separate from the teacher controlling them. Well, you're speaking to the heart of language specialists because they, when you, when you say students are bringing, students are going to the conversation with something. And I think about, okay, multilinguals coming to school with something, meaning like asset space. Mm -hmm. like you Absolutely. Because you're saying like uh, the students already have background knowledge or life experiences that can add to yeah. the richness of the conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that one of the the things that I think is a concern for all teachers is that we honor the strengths that kids have. They know we know they have them. Right. It isn't enough for us to just hold on to that knowledge, but to say, Tan, you're really good at this. When you run these podcasts, you know exactly what to say when I stop talking, because our students in that research from Harvard um, says that our brains are catalyzed when we focus on their strengths. It catalyzes learning, right? And that attention to weaknesses can smother it. And so if we're going to really position ourselves to honor the strengths, we're going to see multi-language speaking kids as an incredible strength in that room. There are so many ways to see and hear and understand their experiences. So I think that the, the opportunity, I'm the um, advisor of our Plymouth State Latinx student group. And I was telling them that one of the things I love about their Instagram feed is they keep making it so welcoming across the Caribbean, across all of these cultures that are part of the Latinx 
designation, right? They're truly trying to welcome everyone in and they're doing all these events with food and with music that will help people see that as a much broader understanding. Well, that can do nothing but enrich our campus. Right. It's just so, I think if I learned nothing from the series of podcasts that I've done is always like, when we see students, what they can do, our, the way we teach changes. Right? And when we- uh, Yeah, see, absolutely. Right? And when we see them as what they can't do, uh, our vision is so limited. Yeah. And I think about, you know, Don Graves, my first really important mentor, the book I was reading when I had that first student in class, he always said that your job as a teacher is to really pay close attention to your students. That's your number one source of information is who are they and what can they do? And we too often are over here looking at a curriculum, right? But it's them. That's our greatest source of knowledge. Right. I think you're um, channeling the great Reggie Raupman when she said, uh -huh. start with the student, not the curriculum. Oh my goodness. Reggie was in the front row, one of the very first times ever presented next to Don Graves. And I was dying. I was like, that's Reggie Raupman. <laughs> and I remember she came up afterwards to shake my head. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> she is. She is the great. Well, she is that great. Someone said on Twitter, because I didn't really know who she was because I only work in the middle school and high school level. But I think she's more mm -hmm. in the elementary school. And then mm -hmm. someone tw uh, tweeted on, on Twitter and they said, sad that the podcast host didn't know that Rigi basically has taught more kids how to read than all of us. <laughs> I'm certain of that. <laughs> well, let's talk about, um, do you provide, what structures do you provide at the book club level for college students? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the shifts I made during uh, online, all online college teaching last year was that I started the year with book clubs instead of independent reading because there was no way to connect to all of my students individually, right? right? I was in this Zoom space. So we started with book clubs the second week of the semester and then four weeks later shifted to another book club. And the shift that I made was I chose 10 titles and students chose two of them. They read one the first four weeks and one the second four weeks, but they all 10 titles were under this big idea. And so I did that again this fall. And what I love is that students, when they get to that second book club, they're all reading the same book, but they're all referencing different books from the first book club. So it just keeps making all of these interesting connections. And three of my students, this was week three yesterday, so they have one more week to finish their book. Three of the students in one class have already finished the book and are reading another book. And my class library is filled with books that are around these similar themes. So now they're making connections between all of these books um, that, you know, frankly, coming in, I put on Twitter, two of the 40 students I have this fall had books in their houses during COVID. They had no access. So they didn't go out and find books and read them on the phone. A few of them read, you know, on um, one of those fan fiction sites that are fabulous, but most of them just stopped reading full length books. So it was a lot of work to get back to, you know, what works. I had to give them time in class to read and confer with them. You know, they're really, it really isn't different because they're only three months older than they were in high school, but um, a lot of, a lot of the same moves. Right. It's funny, you know, I'm sure teachers that listen to this are having this experience, but students are having a hard time coming back to reading. And so I would go around the room and just be like, Hey, what page are you on today? Wow. So you didn't read between Wednesday and Monday? Really? You know, whispered little short conversations. So what's your goal between today and Wednesday? Like what's reasonable? I don't want to overload you. And they're like, yeah, okay, I think I could read 50 pages. Really? How are you going to do that? Like you're continually supporting the, not only the plan, but let's imagine you doing it. You know, actually, when I go to the library, I get a lot done. Will you make a commitment to go to the library and try to read more of this? Because until you do, it's going to feel like a burden. I'm behind, you know. Those conversations are so critical right now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all about the relationships through conversations. So let's talk about the the next essential study, which is poetry. 
Yeah, we called that our big miss in the 180 Days Project because our students wrote next to poetry almost every day and they fl were flooded with poetry, but we never focused on it as a study. And when we finished re write, um, teaching that year, that was 2016, I had proposed a, co a poetry class, an elective from my high school. And actually, my department chair said, no one is going to sign up because no one likes poetry. And I said, well, can we at least try? And I had 100 students, right? And I found out later it was because every time any other section filled up, the guidance people would put them in the poetry section. Well, anybody can do poetry. So I didn't have necessarily 100 kids who wanted to be in poetry, but they loved it. All the performances we did, the poetry tournaments, the knockouts of this poem advances or this poem advances, and um, the studies of an individual author that they loved. Who's the poet that you want to study? And I learned all kinds of poets I'd never heard of. And all of those parts that were so rich in my classroom that first fall, I had these three sections, um, the, the numbers just kept increasing. Kids loved poetry. And I had to find other colleagues who would teach other sections, you know, that I couldn't cover. But we took a lot of that thinking and wove it into this chapter on poetry, which I got to say, here's the biggest difference, Dan. One day I'm sitting here in my notebook and I was like, let's think of the teaching of poetry as a pyramid. And I wrote in the bottom, we analyze a single poem together as a class is probably the central thing that people do in middle and high school with poetry. And then they look at structures and forms and perhaps history. And then at the top, the thing they do the least is let kids write poetry. The kids might write one poem in a long study. And I said, why don't we turn this upside down and have the biggest part of it is they write their own poems. And then, you know, and then the thing we do the least is all together study one poem. That's kind of the fundamental thinking in that chapter. And it absolutely transforms my students' willingness and interest in poetry. That, that switch is really clear. Like, okay, hey, because I know that traditional uh, literature courses, we just read poems after poems after poems and poems and we hap happen to at the end write one or two poems right but i love how you right. switch it now to be like to be a poet you are poets in the making right you are poets now like you have something to share through like really carefully selected words and and sequencing of those ideas like go write and then let's see the moves that you make and let's compare the moves and then we study yeah i mean the fundamental platform is we're going to read this poem together and you could imitate the structure of it, right? Mary Oliver said, that's all of life, love and imitation. And I think about that so much because they can, my students can stand on the shoulders of Clint Smith, who starts a poem with, one thing you should know about me is that as a kid, I once, all my students are writing, something you should know about me is that as a kid, I once, all it does is it just like starts them running. And they fill the, and then they can look back and go, and then how did he turn it at the end? Oh, I could try this phrase. And that's all notebook work. It never has to be a finished poem, but it's an opportunity to immerse yourself in poetic language before you feel like you're ready to be there. You're already there, right? Like you said, it's already inside of you. Right, right. They're already swimming it, and it, we just have to figure out, oh, how do I, how do I, help, how do I help them express it? So the last essential move is digital composition, which really surprised me. And I was like, oh, because I was waiting for like the narrative writing, but I'm like, digital composition. And you started talking about that already, like TikTok and uh, yeah. Instagram and yeah. Yeah. So here's the, in 2008, I was teaching in a regular, my friend's classroom because I was a traveling teacher. And I asked my students during an argument unit to make a digital version of their argument. And I had no idea if this was like a reasonable thing to do. And I told them I didn't care over the three weeks, which one they worked on first, but both were due on the same day. No idea if that was a good idea. They got so engaged in planning and creating these digital arguments. And that drove them to write their essays in a couple of days because they'd done all of the thinking in creating the movies. Now, I didn't know how to do anything they needed. Like, Ms. Kill, how do I get a song off my iPod onto, I have no idea. Does anybody know? Somebody would know. And the kids would take over and do all this teaching. So not only was the workshop fascinating, but I was like, we are missing out on this energy. And so all of the years since then, I've been using this as one of the units that I always teach, which is the students are going to, they can do narrative storytelling via 
digital. They could create arguments. They can create opinion essays. They can create poetry that is then what are the images and the video and how do you want this poem to move? And we study them all over the internet. I think that what I know now is that my daughter, um, and she graduated from college in 2013, she had four or five digital compositions assigned her very first year on campus. Different things that college professors in a course that you would not expect would assign kids to create digitally, not PowerPoint, but actually using a movie maker program where you add volume in music and in your voiceover. And it's um, long past time. See, if, if kids are going to critically analyze all the digital media flooding at them, the best way to become a critical analytical reader is to create it. Right. All of a sudden, you know, I know why you chose that music. And we played with this in 180 days. There's actually three laps around digital. We had kids do digital stories, informational pieces, and digital arguments in 180 days. It is the least used piece of that book. No matter where we go, people will say to people, oh, you studied 180 days. What are, what are you using from that book? They'll talk about narrative. They'll talk about argument. They'll even talk about the informational units or book clubs, but they won't talk about digital. And... I think it feels, we make this analogy in the book that it's like when you sit with your dog and you throw the ball. Like if I throw it a little ways, he'll go get it and I can throw it farther and farther and farther. And I think that for teachers, digital felt like you pitched that ball all the way down the field. When my dog will look at you like, I'm not going after that, right? Not unless I'd give it to you a little bit at a time. And so I think that's what's happened with digital. It feels so big. I'm not prepared. I've never made one myself. Just jump in. Have kids create book trailers, have them, right. have them use, it's on their phone. Right. Yesterday in class, my students were finishing rough drafts that they're going to present tomorrow. And I would say three-fourths of my students were creating their movies on their phones. The apps are there. They're just immediately importing. Why aren't we helping kids use that in a, you know, putting in their writing lens to that activity? Because I say, this is composition, you're planning, you're revising, you're rethinking, you're rereading it, you're listening, you're imagining. It's all the same process. And how do we help you become a little more skilled with that? Because they're, they're very comfortable in consuming digital compositions. They, they do it all the time. That's their, they swim in that and that's the way they communicate and that's with each other. And that's a normal thing. And so it's not normal for, I guess, teachers of our age. <laughs> And so the, it, it's because it's so unfamiliar, they're not really willing to try it. But like you said, just jump in and you'll be surprised at what kids would do. Because I have like students who, I have a student who, she's a sixth grader and she makes cartoons and she voiceovers the cartoons from like anime. Yeah. And I was like, you do that? Because I, and I'm like, why do you do that? She's like, I just do it because it's so fun. And I'm like, and, but there's a whole genre of this. And she like, oh, there I, is. Follow, I follow like the, this YouTuber who does it. And then like, I decided to do it. And now I do it my own. And I'm like, I, I'll ask her how it's a weekend. And she'll say, oh, yeah, I just finished another video. And I was like, wow. Yeah. You know, I the first project this fall was um, the length of one song. I want you to capture something that's important to you. And you only need text slides, music and images. You can add video if you want, but those are the only three variables. So giving them a list of these are all things that can happen in a composition. Which ones do you already know how to do and which ones do you want to learn? Well, that first video, like one of my students did a tribute to her softball season. And at one point in the music, it goes da 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 And she took the video and just had it keep repeating like she was hitting the ball a hundred times like da 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 And I was like, how did you do that? What is that little move that you just made? And show the class because we all want to try it. You know, another student sped up the video when her mom was driving and her mom actually sent me an email and said, I don't drive that fast. She just did that. But, but I thought it was so great that she knew how like these tricks that she's seeing, she's now going, how do I make that work? So the field is huge. It's bigger than what we know, but we want our students to have a little foothold there. Right. Yeah. It's, they always surprise us. You, can you talk about some structures that you put in for this digital composition? Yeah. So, um, you know, in 180 days, Kelly and I started talking about the term lapse. 
And I'd been using it with a colleague at my high school for years. Like they need another lap doing this because then they'll get it better. So this fall, one of the laps with digital was that in their second essay, they had to record a piece of it. So a voice recording or a voiceover is a central piece of digital. And so I said to my students, it's your second lap with narrative because now you're writing fictional research and it's your first lap with digital and we're combining them to do this thing. And so now I could zoom in on clarity, expressiveness, the volume, and most importantly, the pace. When you're creating a voice recording, pace really matters. So they could practice those things. Now they're in to the second lap, which was you're creating a story, right? You're going to use these tools. And if you want to add a voiceover, you've had some practice. Now be the time to practice it again. Well, this is the third lap and they're creating movies and most of them are doing um, some kind of an opinion piece. So it's much more essay-like and they're adding in video from all kinds of sources. So they had to learn clip grab or one of the places that allows you to take video, how to edit it. Um, their intensity in the production of this thing is amazing. Yeah. You want to see engaged students? This is what you, you do. Right? Especially when you say, why don't you think about creating this together? You and a partner. Because we don't do enough collaborative writing. And man, they're talking all the time, the problem solving, the thinking together. What about this? How about if we try this? And all that negotiating that we want kids to learn. So you said before in your one of your first attempts at doing digital composition, you had uh, you had students do an essay, a written piece, a longer extended mm -hmm. piece with the composition, is the d digital composition. Do you, do you do that now? It depends on the project. So what my students are creating right now, some of them have linked directly to the essay they wrote last, and some of them are creating something entirely new. I'm not sure which is better. What I noticed, um, and we wrote about it in the book, was that last year, I asked my students to find a big idea from each of the book club books, and then look at that idea in a digital composition. So your, your books are asking questions that are similar, make those come together. Um, I, some of the most incredible things that kids discovered in weaving the two together. This fall, when I proposed that, there was many more students like really struggling. What's a big idea in this book that connects to this one and really getting stuck at the choosing a topic set of process moves. And I said to them one day in class, you know, the subject is not the most important part. And if that's what's sticky, where you're stuck, then choose a different focus. You do not have to create a composition about the books. Right. And that was like, I was a little afraid there. I actually was being observed that day. And I was like, I said, you guys, I'm just going to confess one of my revisions I'm making to something because I've rethought it. And I think this is a better idea. And the whole time I was like, I'm not sure I should have done this on the day he was in the room. I haven't seen the write-up yet. So we don't know yet if that's a good idea. But my students were like, oh, do you mean I could do something else? I mean, I have a student who lost his little brother, um, a five-year-old. He really wants to do something about that. And I was going to stand in the way and say, no, I want you to write about a book, compose about a book. So as usual... My instinct was right, and I needed to, you know, let the students have more control. Oh, I just, I feel so many teachers are listening. They're like, I want to do this. I want to, it seems like you're teaching from the heart, where right? you're letting your heart lead the instruction. Mm. Right? And I feel like I hope this, with 180 days, gives teachers an opportunity to say, you know what, we could do this. We can rethink literacy mm -hmm. in a different way. Yeah, I think it doesn't matter where we teach in the world. We've got kids in front of us and we know what they need. And I think that too often people present teaching as if instruction, curriculum, assessment are equal players. When actually instruction is the closest thing to the kids. And that is all in the hands of the teacher. And that is always going to be the most important thing that moves kids. And so following your own gut and then having good colleagues to run things by, which has been so important in my relationship with Kelly, because I would say, I think, I think I want to try this. What do you think? You know, and, and sometimes he'd push back and that's what we need. Yeah. That's how we grow. Absolutely. But we're the authors of our work. And I think sometimes we cede that to people who say, do this instead. You know, I don't know if you know, my daughter's a third year teacher. So she has never had a normal year of teaching yet. The first year they went home, the second year 
they came back at the very end of the year and now she's entering her third year in mass. And um, she's, she's not confident at all that she knows what the next best decision is. And we have to remember that teachers are all on this path of growth and they need the support of each other and they need to be encouraged just like students. Principals should be conferring with teachers. What are you thinking about and encouraging them? And I think too often it's just evaluation. Oh, yeah, I think you're, it goes back to what you said about Don Graves, like our, our essential job is to listen to kids. Mm -hmm. They'll tell us what, what they'll need. Right? We just have to figure out how can we meet the requirements of the curriculum and students' requirements. Right, and that's a big ask. That's a big ask. Who else could you ask but the amazing teachers in this world? <laughs> Let's end the, uh, the podcast with two questions. We have this last second to last one. Um, how do you think this book can serve multilingual students? I know that you're not writing for that audience, but you're, you're talking to mm -hmm. teachers who are working with multilingual students. Yeah, and I think that one of the ways that I saw in some of the work I did internationally was um, setting up book clubs where kids that speak different languages are together and can make understandings together. You know, they can, one of the things I love to do is have kids collect beautiful words from a book that they're reading. But when they look at what other students are collecting, and they're having this amazing experience of seeing that what's important to another student is not what's important to them, but that they're all around the same text. That's a beautiful thing. And you're really, it's more than just the label honoring the diversity in your room. Right. You're embracing it and elevating it. Right. Um, so I think all of these things, if you've got a student who is learning English and they often have many other languages, if you put them in digital composition, they are able to use all of their skills, right? That, that are often just sidelined while we focus on this print um, that of course is important, but you're allowing them to, to just kind of flex their muscles as thinkers and creators. I think when you, talk, when you talked about that, I was like, yes, digital composition will help highlight what students can already do. So, cause technology uh -huh. is an amplifier of skills, right? Yes. And so a kid who, isn't going to write the essay yet because because uh, their skill levels are still developing, but can still do the same critical thinking that w is required in a digital composition. You'll be blown away yeah. that at the end. Right? Absolutely, it's helping them see. It's helping us, teachers and students, their classmates, see them in a different way through digital composition. Mm -hmm. right. Well, we all want to be seen. Yes, yes we all want to be seen. Ugh. Yeah. And be seen and realize that we are more than enough. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Well, let's end with this. I only reserve this for uh, the most prolific. And I asked Regie this as well. When <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you're highly qualified. More than qualified to answer this. Um, so Oprah has something called uh, This I Know For Sure. Right? So, oh. After years of advocacy, what do you know for sure, Penny, about teaching? What do I know for sure about teaching? I know that um, we create the weather in our classroom and we come in with um, opportunity and possibility and joy with the students that are before us and that our students are watching everything we do. And we want to always remember that the gift we have to offer them is that um, reading, writing, thinking, creating are fuel, things that fuel me still in ways that are joyful and fulfilling. And so I want to, you know, like charm students into this relationship with their own literacy, their own notebooks, to carry those notebooks with them, to give them to their grandchildren so they know they're a legacy that's being built right now. That is, so here, this, I think I, have, I want to ask another question connected to that. So <laughs> why, why, what do you, so these are all uh, future teachers, right? Like, please, like No, all of, I only have one student who's an education major. Oh, so I'm teaching you, freshman writing, first year writing to whoever. Oh, okay, okay. So to whoever, so you want this to remember, okay. okay. Yeah. Well, okay, then I want to ask that question then. <laughs> Uh, do you know what? I taught uh, 
elementary and secondary methods when I was at Eastern Michigan University. And that was in the 90s, so a long time ago. And I really loved it. I thought that might be my calling to do that work. But when we moved out here and I went back into a classroom, I realized that I mostly want to work with those who are in it right now. I love talking to college students that are prospective teachers that are still filled with wonder. And, you know, I, I love that. But I also really love teachers who are in the work because it is so demanding and so important. And everything that you talk about is true about a kid you have right now. And that kid needs you to think deeply about these things right now. And I think that with college students, they're looking ahead when I get to, and it's just a little different work. Well, that's the gift you keep on giving to us to help us mm -hmm. be in the work. That's what you said, right? Mm -hmm. So you keep constantly helping us be in our work to be, to teach in a different way, to remind us what really matters, to anchor us to the truths. Uh -huh. I know that I, when I said, uh, Someone said Rigi is one of the people who have helped more, have, have taught more students to read than others. I would say that you and Kelly are one of those teachers who have helped us mm -hmm. reach the hearts of readers and writers more than others. So thank you. That's generous praise. Thank you.